stand. We'll pray and then we'll, we'll just go ahead into our scripture. If uh, our brother, uh, ask our, my brother Ted Pulse, and he'll lead us in prayer this evening, Ted. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for each person who is here today. We pray that you would bless each one, that you would bless our families and help everything. We know, Father, that there's many on this prayer list. We pray that you would watch over each one and that you would help live. them, Lord, and help them to realize that they're going the wrong direction. Father, we pray that you would give them the direction to go in for us to live. We pray these things in Jesus' name. For us. <coughs> okay, so we're going to read from Revelation 6, and we're just going to read the verses 9 and 10. So if you're ready for the word of God, would you signify that by saying amen? Amen. Okay, Revelation 6, 9 and 10 follows. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Okay, thank you. So, we've... Uh, we're at the midway point of the tribulation as the, the fifth seal really bridges the gap from the tribulation into the great tribulation. And uh, as I mentioned at the close of our last lesson, with the four horsemen, uh, I prefer to think of them as uh, being empowered by a force, uh, the first one being false peace. The second one, war. The third one, famine. And the fourth, death. And the fifth seal is also portrayed then by a force. And uh, it's a little bit different force. What, what, what uh, propels the fifth seal is the prayer of God's saints for him to enact vengeance on a rebellious mankind. And as we look at these uh, next few verses, we're going to be looking at three features that are unveiled in the fifth seal. That being the persons involved, the petition that they have, and the promise they will receive. And we'll follow that outline as we study this particular section of Scripture. So we're going to begin with the persons involved. And as we begin with the persons involved, as with the other four seals, it says in verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, he being, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the only one with the authority to take back the universe. And we see now another sequence of the unfolding of divine judgment, and it's revealed to us by what John sees. And what John sees under the altar, he sees the souls of those who have been slain. And these are martyrs. These are the martyrs uh, who are killed, I would say, during the time of the judgments. In addition to the divine judgment uh, through, the, through the time of the false peace, the war, the famine, disease, and death dominating an unbelieving world, there will additionally be widespread persecution of believers. Persecution, which has never been felt before on the face of the earth because the person
persecution will be led by Satan, and he will be given a certain ability to function uh, during part of this time frame. So, we're going to, uh, Jesus taught what we've been looking at in the Olivet Discourse, uh, exactly as we have been looking at it in Matthew 24. And as we've mentioned before, the first seven verses of Matthew 24 describe the first four seals. Now, the fifth seal, describing martyrs, is Jesus described in Matthew 24, 9, where he says, Then they will deliver up to you tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And the event that marks the midpoint of the tribulation is the abomination of desolation. And that happens in Matthew 24 in the 15th verse. Therefore, the persecution that Jesus is speaking of in the ninth, uh, in the ninth verse is actually a persecution that has already begun at the beginning of the fifth seal. And that's a persecution that has been, let's call it, simmering throughout the first half of the tribulation. And I'll speak a little bit to that later. And it's going to then escalate after the abomination of desolation. And uh, the abomination of desolation is mainly what I'm going to talk about tonight. And, uh, and I want you to try to, to stay with me. And if you have questions, just ask them. doesn't necessarily mean I'll have answers. But uh, there is, in reality, uh, two abominations of desolations mentioned in the Word of God. One was committed in the second century B.C. by the Syrian kin, uh, king Antiochus. Antiochus Epiphanes was his name. And I'll talk a little bit more about him later. He committed an abomination of desolation, which the Antichrist will in some ways mimic, but when the Antichrist commits his atrocities, they will make what Antiochus did look rather uh, small in nature. <laughs> he, will, uh, he will amplify what Antiochus is. So let's stop and look at the, uh, the abomination of desolation. And I'd like to look at it as I do, as I look at end time events, and I've told you before, I look at, at everything from the, the perspective of Matthew 24. Because those are Jesus' words. And so for me, they, 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 I, I look at them and then I, I fill in all the blanks with all of the other material that we have to fill in those blanks. And uh, so if you'll allow me that latitude, I'll, I'll be looking in quite a bit in Matthew this evening and then also quite a bit in Daniel. And I'll, I'll actually ask you to turn to Daniel if you want to stick your finger back in the, in the Old Testament as we go back and forth. But as we've noted in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus is speaking of a coming time of indescribable horror in the world. And we need to realize that a lot of what Jesus speaks to in this future time is focused on the nation Israel. Okay? That makes sense. God's chosen people. Okay, so a lot of, and, 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 and that is expressed by the prophets too, the nation Israel. Uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, Zechariah spoke of these future, each of them spoke of these future times in some of their writings. And Israel, uh, as a nation, in the people, the Jewish people in general, have endured many periods of great suffering throughout their history. We're familiar with that. Uh, the first, uh, the, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD, that was a catastrophic thing for them. The ex extermination of millions of Jews by the Nazis and by the Russians in World War II and immediately following. But the Holocaust that the nation Israel will uh, be submitted to in the end times will make all of those things appear to be minor. They will suffer as really as no people have ever suffered. Uh, and that's, that's 
that's just their lot. So now in Matthew 24, 4 through 14, Jesus foretells of six signs of his coming again that he calls, he refers to as birth pangs, coming with greater rapidity and severity until, in fact, the child is born. Then in the 15th verse, he says there this, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, he says, let him understand. Okay? Those are Jesus' words in 24-15. If you had your harmony of the Gospels, like I encourage you to have, if you, if you had your harmony, you would see in Luke, in 21-20 of Luke, there's a little bit added to that conversation. Luke says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. So that's a clue. You want to be, if you want to know, when, when these things start happening, I don't know how God's people wouldn't know what's going on, but the thing is, we're all going to be gone. But, but if you're not gone, get on your knees first. But there will be those that sit in churches today that will experience these times because they're not saved. There will be people that have played at, the, at being a Christian in church. But this is a very telltale sign that the abomination of desolation is coming when Israel is surrounded by armies. And remember, the abomination of desolation indicates the time of the Great Tribulation. So things are only getting worse. And they're only getting worse quickly. In other words, uh, this is when Jerusalem will be surrounded by any enemy nations who threaten to destroy her, and that will be a sign that this is about to take place. Now, for several decades, the modern nation of Israel has increasingly become a focal point of world events. Uh, events that not only involve a those that live in the Middle East, but events that involve the world's superpowers, the United States, Russia, China, many of the European nations. We all know of the, the concern that uh, the Israelis have over the acquisition of nuclear weapons by their enemies. Uh, I can assure you, whatever the North Koreans have, the Iranians will soon have because they're sister, sister nations in the way they, on their outlook on things, on things. So the outlook towards the future in that part of the world is definitely negative in nature. And previously we have seen that during the end times, the Antichrist will be the leader of a ten-nation confederacy of European nations. And those European nations, when you see that confederacy, it will generally, I believe, uh, reflect the territory of the ancient Roman Empire. That's, that's what I believe. And he will be the one that will be the first to make an alliance with Israel, the false peace. And after he gains victories over the nations from the south, north, and east who have come against Israel, then he will review, reveal his true colors. He will reveal his evil character, and he will reveal his hatred for the nation Israel. And it is while under the guise of being their protector that the Antichrist will in fact turn and commit the abomination of desolation. It will be kind of like his coming out party. There will be no more charade. It will be blatantly obvious who and what he is, and who, and you'll be, and everyone will be able to show, he will show everyone his true colors. People will understand who he is. And when you look at the Greek, when you look at the word for abomination, it's baduglama, baduglama. And baduglama is, it means something that you detest. It is something that you find repulsive and disgusting, disgusting in nature. And when that word is used in the Greek in scripture, it's usually associated with items of idolatry and gross ungodliness. Okay? Things that are 
diametrically opposed to God. And the Hebrew equivalent of this word was often used in regards to rites and paraphernalia associated with the wicked conduct of pagan religions. Okay? This is a word that we will look at much more in the 17th chapter when we examine in detail Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Because we're going to talk about false world religions and false the, uh, how those things were birthed. Now the abomination of desolation is really better translated the abomination that makes desolate or the abomination that lays waste. So in other words, the abomination, the disgusting, repulsive thing happens and because it happens, it makes what is there desolate. See, the temple in Jerusalem will become a place where no Jew will want to step foot in. Because of the abomination that will take place there, it will be of such, uh, it will be, they will find it so repulsive that no one will want to go to the temple. So, uh, it, it, the, the, the wording is better, the abomination which makes desolate. And it, in other words, so Daniel refers to this in Daniel, if you want to look in Daniel, and I'll, I'll I'll be jumping around a little bit in Daniel, but Daniel refers to this three times. In 927, 1131, and then uh, 1211. And most Bible scholars, uh, no matter what their views on eschatology, identify the abomination uh, that is uh, being characterized here as uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the, the sacrilege of Antiochus. The, I believe he was Antiochus IV. He was the Syrian ruler of Palestine from 175 to 165 B.C. And he was a surrogate of the Greek Empire. Okay? That was towards the end of the Greek Empire before the Romans came in. And he took, he took, for, him saying, his, he took for himself the name Theos, Epiphanes, which literally means when you translate it, what's Theos? God. God and what's Epiphanes? Revealed, manifested. So that was his, that's what he called himself. He was God manifested, quite a name. But his, his enemies had a name for him. They called him Epiphanes. And Epiphanes means uh, someone who is crazy out of their mind. So they would call him Theos Epiphanes. And, uh, but uh, he died actually uh, a couple of years after he left his throne in 163 B.C. And he, he was thought to be actually clinically insane when he died. And it, most writers will say he was caused to be insane by the defeats he took against the, the, the Jews. You know who was fighting with, uh, with these rulers back in those days? The Maccabeans, okay? And there's the, how many of you have ever read 1st and 2nd Maccabees? Uh, uh, 1st and 2nd Mac Maccabees is uh, what we would call an apocryphal book. Are you familiar with apocryphal? Yeah, they're in the Catholic Bible. Apocryphal books, what is, what is something that is apocryphal? That's one of those religious words that we throw around. It simply means something that's apocryphal has a questionable author, a questionable uh, authenticity. But the thing about Maccabees that make it interesting is that from a historical perspective, they're pretty accurate. Especially when you read of the, uh, the Maccabeans were some pretty mean folks. Those were, those were the Jewish rebels that were fighting against whomever was trying to hold them in, in, in sway. And the, the text of Daniel 11, 21 through 35, perfectly describes the rule of Antiochus. Antiochus, 
And in verse 21, it refers to how he attained his throne. Uh, verses 24 through 27 speak to how uh, Antiochus made numerous excursion, excursions into Egypt. How, in verse 28, Antiochus, who has a covenant with the nation Israel, uh, breaks that covenant. And then, in verse 31, it speaks to the desecration of the temple. And, as I said, uh, those times are depicted in Daniel 11, and they're very vividly depicted in uh, Maccabeus. And the Jews were zealous in their uh, fight against Antiochus, and they beat, they, they were able to defeat him several times in military conflicts, but at the same time, he slaughtered thousands of Jews. And he, his particular technique was to go into villages and kill all the women. And then he would take, uh, he would take, uh, no, I'm, excuse me, he would kill the men and he would take the women. The women had more value than the men. So he would kill the men, take the women, and take the children and sell them into slavery. And in that way he would increase his own uh, his own value. And Antiochus did desecrate the temple by sacrificing a pig on the altar. Not only did he sacrifice a pig on the altar, which is the most unclean animal in Judaism, he made the priest eat the meat. Uh, so he was a he was a, he was a very, very evil man, and so he he went ahead and perpetrated that abomination. <coughs> and then what did he do? See, uh, Antiochus thought that, remember I told you his name was God manifested, God revealed. He thought he was the earthly representation of Zeus. So he sent, set up in the Jewish temple a statue of Zeus. Okay, And the, he, that that defilement, it, defilement is almost a precursor, an example of what the greater abomination of desolation is going to look like that will be committed by the Antichrist in the end times. And we're, we'll get there. So in that, Daniel 9.24, it speaks of 70 weeks. It says 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring to everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks. And seventy weeks are literally seventy sevens. In, okay, seventy weeks, or 77s, and those those are really years. It refers to, it's a year uh, measurement. And in other words, so 70 times 7, 490 years. Uh, and what Daniel was trying to explain, that 490 years would transpire before the Messiah would return to establish his eternal kingdom of righteousness. Okay, and stay with me. So, as Daniel explains in the following verse, he says that measurement would begin, he says, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild or build Jerusalem. And when did that happen? Who did that happen with? Who did that happen with? Okay, King Cyrus, uh, in the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And how about Nehemiah 2? No, Ezra. And, Ar and Artaxerxes? Yes. So we have a, a time frame with which we can calculate some of these things. And we can actually, some of these things we can actually see. 
This isn't, this isn't smoke and mirrors. This isn't the, the second coming where we can't see. And you do have a chart on the back of your outlines. I don't know if you've got, that's, uh, what's that guy's name? Larkin? That's uh, one of his end time. And if you go on to his website, man, he's got some charts that are, he's got some great materials. So, but when you look at this, the, the decree by King uh, Artaxerxes was in 445 B.C., okay? That's what Nehemiah 2, 5, and 6 tells us. And the prophet Daniel also explains to us that seven weeks and 62 weeks, which equals 483 years, would pass until, he uses the phrase, the Messiah the Prince. That's his words. Messiah the Prince, he says at 925. And that has been calculated, that 483 years from the time of the decree to the exact year is the year that we're, is the time. Isn't it great how God works? <laughs> because we're getting ready for Easter. And this is the exact time when Jesus will enter into 483 years from the date of that declaration, 483 years forward, and now Jesus triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. And what is he hailed as? He's hailed as the king. He's going to overthrow... The, he's going to overthrow the dastardly Romans. He's, uh, he's the king, he's the Messiah, and the multitudes, and when they use that word multitudes, there were multitudes. I've, I've read, uh, I've read uh, estimations of hundreds of thousands where they are hailing his, his arrival in the city. Why would there be so many people in Jerusalem? Passover. It's Passover. You got the perfect audience. So the the accuracy is cannot be denied here. And Daniel 9 26 notes that after that time and before the 70th, 70th and final weeks of week of years, it says, and after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall the people of the prince who is to come. That's a little p. So who's that prince? That's Antichrist. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? So this is the picture. And then I believe this is the picture immediately following Jesus. It says that he shall be cut off. He'll be cut off. Okay, Jesus is crucified, and then we have 70 years, and what happens? The, the well, or 40 years, or however many years are left. We have the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. And then, in verse 27, the deceitful prince shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, seven years, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. He will make the temple so no one will want to walk in the, in the temple, even until the consummation, which is determined, is pour out, poured out on the desolate. It, it ends. That last week or seven-year period of the 70 weeks will begin when Israel makes the covenant with the Antichrist. Israel will believe that the Antichrist is its deliverer. Do you get the, the, the picture? Israel will make a treaty with the Antichrist. That's how deceived they will be. Then it will be a seven-year treaty. Yes, it will be a seven-year treaty that will be uh, violated after the, the midway point. But... Israel will, Israel will be totally deceived. So how does that happen? How does that deception take place? Well, modern day Israel, I just saw a thing the other day, uh, you know, I'm a sportsaholic. Uh, it was about
about some golfers who went to Israel. And they were over there during the last round of missile attacks. And these guys are golfers. These guys, you know, they're making a couple million dollars a year. And they actually were over there on a, on a Christian mission. And uh, they were saying how they were, they were impressed by two things. They were impressed that the people took the missile attacks so uh, matter-of-factly. It was as, as if it was all part of daily life. But they also said that it was evident that everyone had fear in their eyes. And that's, that's the conditioning of Israel for the deception that's going to happen. They will be literally outnumbered <coughs> immensely. Somebody have that yet? 
If you get there, read it, please. The whole verse? Yeah, Matthew 24. 50. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, in parentheses, whoever reads, let him understand. Yeah. Hey, thank you. So, there has been many suggestions as to what the holy place is. Some suggest it's the city of Jerusalem. Some suggest it's the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the temple, etc. Uh, the only other passage where that phrase is used in the New Testament is in Acts 21-28, uh, where they're speaking against uh, Paul, and they say that he's brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled the holy place. David in uh, Psalms 24 refers to the uh, temple as the holy place. So it would seem that would be an appropriate and reasonable interpretation for this, the holy place. And uh, back now in Daniel's in 12, in 12, 11 in Daniel it says, and from, the, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of des desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now, the desecration of the temple will be a continual thing. It's not going to be one event. Uh, the Antichrist will. That's why I believe the phrase used, standing in the holy place, is used. The, the desecration will continue in the, t the temple. Uh, because I think a, a continuous act is implied. But from the, from the time that daily sacrificing is canceled, and the abomination of desolation begins, there will be 1,290 1, days that will pass. That, and that is 30 days more than three and a half years. Okay? Yes, Marty? Well, what does the Antichrist, what is his abomination of death? Does he set up an image of himself? Yeah, I'll talk. In Revelation, we read that, don't we? Yeah, I'll talk about that. I think it's just a, a lot like uh, Antiochus. He does the, essentially the same thing, except this image gets to talk mm -hmm. because of the. Uh, it's a wizard of Oz. A false prophet will <laughs> enable the image to talk. But so what Daniel says is that we have three and a half years plus thirty days. So what's the extra thirty days for? Because you really you've got to figure. If, 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 you have to come up with some idea what the 30 days are for. Okay? There's three and a half years. If it's if 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 if, if we're going to be accurate and say, okay, it was 483 years and blam, then then Jesus entered Jerusalem. If there's 30 days extra, we have to figure out what's going on in those 30 days. And the thing is, is that scripture doesn't really tell us. So there has to be some conjecture on your point. So I'll give you my conjecture. And you can, you can check it out for yourself and figure out what it might be. My explanation is that the 30 days will cover the time. Jesus will descend on the Mount of Olives. And what will he do when he descends upon the Mount of Olives? The Mount will split it. He's going to create a valley. And what's going to transpire in that valley? Okay, but what's going to transpire in the valley? The nations will be all Amen. around it. Amen. Uh, I had a real funny discussion with somebody. But that is when the judgment of the nations will take place. And really what the, the word implies is that it will be much like, and I've talked to you before how in Rome, when the Romans conquered a country, they brought back uh, uh, the country's animals because there were animals that nobody had ever seen. You know, when they when they conquered a nation in Africa, they brought back lions and tigers. And bears. And, and, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, nobody in Rome had ever seen lions and tigers, and they're saying, "Man, we're, we're, we're great people." And they would bring back uh, the slaves, the, the most healthy men. They would bring back. The, the, uh, the rulers, and they, the rulers would be bowing down to Caesar to show who they were. The procession of nations that will take place 
will be, and I'm not saying, that, remember God is, the God does not have vengeance. God is just. So the judgment of the nations will take place as with one of those prophet, uh, processions. And how long will it take to judge the nations? 30 days. That's, that's, how, that's how I account. For the 30 days. <laughs> so then, Daniel asked. What do you say, Daddy? You know, this is here, so you have to talk about it because we have to have, you know. Add, Daniel's going to add another 45 days for us in 12 12. He's going to say, Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So we have another 45 days that added. And this additional time would seem to me to be the time that Jesus establishes his throne in Jerusalem and sends you and me out into our leadership positions in the world as we assist him in his millennial kingdom. We will rule with him. Okay? Okay? Some of you were skeptical. Yeah, it says so. so it's good, it says right. Yeah. <laughs> we will rule, we will function. What's that? I said, uh, this is at the end of the. This seven is at years, the end of the whole deal. And this is the millennial reign. Then. Yes. He's coming he down, ready? he's setting up his kingdom, and we are going to be his assistants. He's going to, we're going to, he's going to, however, he communicates to us. He will communicate to us what his expectations are. We will go out, uh, you know. So when, when you said the tribulation and the great tribulation, is it the first three and a half years versus the last three and a half years? Yes. The, 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 the last three and a half years are referred to as the great tribulation. And the That's, Antichrist is made known in that last three and a half. Uh -huh. And the Antichrist himself will be made known. Oh, yeah. He, he will not, there will the be no more mass. Trip. There won't be... It's worship me or I'll make you into toast. And that's not until the mid-trip or that yes. second three and a half years. So that's what I think. He will. We will be his appointed representatives. We'll go out into the world and the world will function uh, as it's supposed to function for about a thousand, thousand years and then we'll go from there. So what we have is 1,260 days of trouble, the Great Tribulation, followed by 30 days when mankind's kingdom will actually be torn apart. That's what's going to happen. And then that will be followed by 45 days when God will set up God's kingdom. Jesus Christ's rightful kingdom. Okay? So now we'll, we'll, we'll get back to Revelation. And Revelation has other details for us. And uh, we know that the, the the Antichrist is pictured as a beast coming out of the sea. And it says he will be given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months, which is three and a half years. And that, that equates to the 1260 days of the Great Tribulation. And as the Antichrist now continues more blatantly with his blasphemies against God. Uh, he will blaspheme God. He will blaspheme the tabernacle. He will, uh, and he will vehemently pursue anyone who he considers to be a heavenly citizen. It says in 7 and 8, it says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. That means everybody. All who dwell on the earth who worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And his cohort, now the false prophet, is going to join him. And the false prophet will validate the Antichrist by the materialization of great signs and wonders. He will be the miracle worker. And he will promote the worship of the Antichrist by his miraculous acts. And uh, in fact, it is via the, the false prophet that the beast uh, that is
as set up in the temple will be able to talk. And if you refuse to worship the beast, you will be put to death. And like I said earlier, Antiochus had set up an idol in the temple to be worshipped by the Jews. But the Antichrist will go one step, one step further. The Antichrist will set up himself. He, won't, he will set up a, an image of himself and or himself to be worshipped in the temple. And he will demand that everyone that walks the face of the earth worship him. There will be no alibis, no excuses. There's nothing that will save you from... Uh, not worshiping. The only way you will not be able to worship him is to uh, is to uh, perish. And he'll he'll end all of the Jewish sacrifices in the temple. He'll commit the the abomination that makes the holy place desecrated and desolate. And it'll be a place, like I said, that the Jews won't want to go to. No Jew would want to be there. It's a place for the place. So here we have another picture. The place for the worship of God by His chosen people will become a place that no Jew will want to step into. Uh, and that's how the Antichrist works. Things end up 180 pretty different. So, and he's endued as Satan himself. Yeah. And he, so the, the word refers to him. He is the man of lawlessness. He's called the son of destruction. And he will oppose and exalt himself above everybody else at this time in history. And in Second Thessalonians three or two, three and four, it says so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And he will tell everybody, God has come. And I believe that he will he will be portrayed as the 12th Imam, mm. that is the, the Islam uh, Messiah that we spoke mm. about when we studied the, the world's religions. And this is uh, further on in verses 9 and 10, it says, The coming of the lawless one, according to the working of Satan, he will have all power, signs, and many <coughs> wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That describes those that are lost. And that's really, to me, uh, those that are described in that last part, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's really, to me, the abomination of desolation. Because those people will still not understand who God is. So, verses 6 and 7 told us, shows us why this evilness is allowed to exist. It says, uh, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, that's God, only he who now restrains will do so until his take, he is taken out of the way. What happens at the end of the tribulation and at the beginning of the great tribulation is Satan, in essence, is, is given the world to run rampant all over the face of the earth as uh, the restraints are removed. What would be the removing of the restraints? God's spirit will be removed. At uh, so what time is that? I believe that God's spirit is removed during the Great Tribulation. But he, he, he still works. Oh yeah, he's still going to work because he's God. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. But it will be like in Old Testament. Do you think? Oh, I think it'll be worse. I know. I mean, the spirit will come down as it did in Old Testament upon those people uh -huh. of God. Like the seven hundred four hundred forty-four thousand will be yeah, there has to by be, the Holy Spirit. There has to be still God movement on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, but it will be as in the Old Testament, it will be working at in his in his discretion. Yes. And in his time. Yes. On certain people. Uh, there will be I'm looking for a phrase to describe how that will work. Like he came upon David, for example. Like he came upon a lot of the Old Testament saints, uh, Moses, the prophets. Uh, but the, 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 the hands, the, the restraints, the hands that have held Satan back will no longer hold him back. 
allowed to fully manifest his his power. You know, he's not omnipresent. He's not omniscient. omniscient. Uh, but he will be manifest. He will be able to manifest his powers uh, to the greatest extent that he's capable. Until that time. Yes, yes. Well, it's going to be a great millennial kingdom. I'm not sure what we're going to do. 